Metallurgy is the science which deals with the internal structure of metals and the relationship between those structures and the properties exhibited by metals. When referring to welding metallurgy, the concerns are about the various changes that occur in metals when joined by welding, especially those affecting the mechanical properties. It is certainly appropriate for welding personnel to be knowledgeable in the basics of welding metallurgy. Granted, it is unlikely that the employee will be responsible for the specification of base or weld metal alloys or their treatment. However, an understanding of the basics of welding metallurgy is not only helpful to welding personnel, but often a requirement for many inspection functions. One reason for this is that the mechanical properties of metals, such as strength, hardness, ductility, toughness, fatigue strength, and abrasion resistance, are all affected by the metallurgical transformations as a result of welding. These properties are affected by various metallurgical factors, including alloy additions, thermal treatments, and mechanical treatments. Welding personnel who have an understanding of these properties will have a better feel for why certain fabrication operations are necessary. Certain fabrication requirements, such as preheat, postheat, interpass temperature control, heat input control, peening, thermal stress relief, and other heat treatments can all result in some type of metallurgical change which in turn will affect the metal's mechanical properties. Therefore, this section will primarily describe certain aspects of ferrous or iron-based welding metallurgy with emphasis on the need for fabrication methods to control the changes which can occur. Since the topic of welding metallurgy includes numerous facets, it would be unreasonable to think that this discussion could cover them all. So, we will limit the coverage to those more important changes which may occur during the welding operation. These changes can be summarized and divided into two categories. The first category includes those changes which occur in a metal as it is heated from room temperature to a higher temperature and those changes occurring when a metal is cooled from a high temperature to a lower temperature. The second category is the effect on the metal's properties versus the rate at which these temperature changes occur. More specifically, we are concerned with how quickly a hot metal cools to room temperature, that is, the metal's cooling rate. Our discussion will begin with specific references to the changes which occur in metals as they are heated and cooled uniformly. However, it must be noted that welding presents some very different problems since the welding operation tends to heat very localized areas of the metal. Consequently, this non-uniform heating cooling creates the need for some additional consideration. To gain an understanding of the metallurgical properties of metals, it is necessary to start the discussion by describing some of the properties of the particles which comprise all forms of matter. These basic particles, which combine to form solid, liquid, and gaseous materials, are referred to as atoms. These atoms are so small that they cannot be seen even with the most powerful microscopes. However, by starting the discussion at this level and explaining the properties of these atoms and their structures, we will be able to better understand some of the phenomena which we can observe macroscopically or with the naked eye. One of the important properties of these atoms is that at certain temperature ranges, they tend to form substances having specific shapes. 
This is because there are definite forces acting between these individual atoms when they are placed within certain distances of each other. These forces tend to both pull or attract the atoms toward one another, while at the same time the atoms are pushed away or repelled from one another. Therefore, the individual atoms are held in their particular home positions relative to all of the other atoms around them by these counteracting forces. These atoms in their home positions are aligned row upon row, layer upon layer, in a three-dimensional, symmetrical, crystalline lattice structure or pattern. They are not, however, stationary in these positions. In reality, they tend to vibrate about an equilibrium position to maintain a balanced spacing. At a given temperature, they will remain at an equilibrium spacing for that particular temperature. When there is a balance between the attractive and repulsive forces, we say that the internal energy of the metal is at a stable level. Any attempt to force the atoms closer together will be counteracted by repulsive forces, which increase as the atoms are pushed closer together. This behavior is evidenced by the fact that metals exhibit extremely high compressive strengths. Similarly, any attempt to pull the atoms further apart will result in a counteracting attractive force. These attractive forces, however, tend to decrease as the atoms are pulled further apart. If the load on the tensile specimen is increased beyond the metal's yield point, it will then behave plastically. Now, it will no longer return to its original size or interatomic spacing because the atoms have been forced far enough away from each other that the attractive forces are no longer strong enough to hold them in their original position. When the interatomic spacing further increases to the point that the attractive forces are no longer strong enough to hold the atoms together, the metal will fail. It was noted before that the metal atoms exhibit a very specific spacing at a given temperature or internal energy. Since heat is a form of energy, the internal energy of a metal is increased when its temperature is raised. This additional energy tends to cause the atoms to vibrate more which increases their interatomic spacing. We can observe the result of this additional energy visually because the overall size of the piece of metal will increase as the individual atoms move apart. Conversely, any decrease in the temperature of the metal will result in the atoms moving closer together, which in turn is observed as a contraction of the metal. As additional heat is added to the metal, the vibration of the atoms continues to increase, causing the spacing to increase and consequently the metal to expand. This will continue to some point at which the interatomic spacing is so great that the atoms are no longer attracted enough to exhibit any specific structure. The solid metal then transforms into a liquid. The temperature associated with this change is referred to as the melting point. Further heating would eventually transform the liquid into a gas. This last transformation occurs at a temperature known as the vapor point. Solid metal has the lowest internal energy and the shortest interatomic spacing. Liquid metal has a higher internal energy with greater interatomic spacing and is considered to be amorphous, which means that it is unstructured. 
gaseous metal has the highest internal energy, the greatest inner atomic spacing, and is also unstructured. While all of this is rather intriguing, it is more significant to realize why it is important to you as a welding professional. It is obvious that welding and cutting introduce heat into a metal. This heating will result in an expansion of the metal. If we were considering the uniform heating of a metal, we would be able to measure the change in length or size of a piece of metal as it is heated. Each metal alloy has associated with it a specific coefficient of thermal expansion. That is, there is a certain numerical value which describes how much a metal will expand for a given increase in temperature. With welding, however, the heat is not applied uniformly. That is, Part of the metal is raised to some very high temperature, while the metal adjacent to the weld zone remains at a lower temperature. This results in different amounts of expansion of the metal at different locations relative to the weld zone. The portion of the metal being directly heated will tend to expand, with this expansion being resisted by that metal which is at some lower temperature. The display on your screen illustrates the dimensional changes which occur in a straight bar, see display A, that is heated on one side by a welding arc. In display B, the arc is struck and the plate begins to heat under the influence of the arc. The heated portion expands, see display C, and because it is partially restrained by the portion of the bar that is not heated, the bar tends to bend in an arc at each end away from the heat source. Since the hot portion is weaker, part of it is actually liquid and is very weak, it does not succeed in forcing the bar to bend very much. The hot part is less restrained in the sideways direction, so it tends to get wider on the side where the heat is applied. When the arc is extinguished, see display D, the hot molten portion begins to cool and shrink. Heat always flows from the hot area to the cold, so during cooling, the heat flows into the previously cool region to warm it. Now, as the hot, expanded portion begins to cool, it contracts, reversing the direction of the deforming forces, which ultimately causes the length along the top of the bar to shorten, and the ends of the bar to lift upward, giving the bar a concave shape as it cools, shown in display E. Therefore, as we apply heat to a part in a non-uniform manner, as is the case for welding, the result is a dimensional change from the thermal stresses developed, causing the part to be distorted or warped when it cools. Display F represents the re-solidified bar with the residual stress level remaining in the bar, denoted by the coiled spring representation. Whenever a metal is melted in a small, localized zone, as in welding, shrinkage stresses are created. Even if the bar had been externally restrained during this heating and cooling cycle, the cooled part still contains stresses caused by this differential heating and cooling. We refer to these stresses as residual stresses. The residual stresses tend to keep the bar in its bent shape. However, the bar will not bend anymore because it has cooled to room temperature and is now stronger than the forces exerted by the residual stress. The residual stresses will remain in the bar unless something is done to relax the stress.
There are several ways of reducing or eliminating residual stresses. It can be done thermally, where the entire part or a large band containing the weld zone is heated uniformly and held at some temperature for a prescribed time period. The result of this method is that the uniform heating allows the residual stress to relax because the metal's strength is now reduced. Slow uniform cooling to room temperature will then produce a part with much lower residual stress. There are also methods of providing this stress relief treatment by the application of a vibratory or mechanical treatment. Both methods have been shown to be effective in many applications. A third method of reducing residual stresses, which can be done in conjunction with the welding operation, is known as peening. This is also a mechanical treatment. Peening involves the use of a heavy pneumatic hammer, not a deslagging hammer, which is used to pound on the face of intermediate layers of a multi-pass weld. This hammering action tends to deform the surface, causing the thickness of the layer to decrease. This deformation tends to spread out the face of the weld to make it longer, and wider. Since the metal is spread out slightly, the residual stresses are reduced. When heavy peening is used for stress relieving, care should be taken to prevent the cracking of the weld by this aggressive mechanical treatment. It is not advisable to peen the root layer which may be easily fractured by this hammering. Normally, the final layer is not peened either, but for a different reason. A heavily peened surface can mask the presence of discontinuities, making inspection more difficult. When properly applied, peening provides a very effective way of reducing residual stresses when welds are made in heavy sections, or in situations where the welds are rigidly restrained. In a solid metal, the atoms tend to align themselves into orderly lines, rows, and layers to form three-dimensional crystalline structures. Metals are, by definition, crystalline, and any discussion of failures due to crystallization is, of course, incorrect. When a metal solidifies, it always does so in a crystalline pattern. The crystalline fracture surface appearance, mistakenly referred to, is usually typical of a fatigue or brittle fracture surface. The smallest number of atoms that can completely describe their orderly arrangement is referred to as a unit cell. It is important to realize that unit cells do not exist as independent units, but share atoms with adjoining unit cells in a three-dimensional array. The most common crystal structures, or phases, are body-centered cubic, BCC, face-centered cubic, FCC, body-centered tetragonal, BCT, and hexagonal close-packed HCP. These are shown in the display on your screen. Some metals, such as iron, exist as one solid phase at room temperature and as another solid phase at elevated temperatures. This change with temperature from one phase to another in a solid metal is known as allotropic or solid state phase transformation. A metal crystal possessing different structures but the same chemical composition is referred to as allotropic. This will be discussed in greater detail later. The BCC unit cell can be described as a cube with an atom at each of the eight corners 
and a single atom at the center of the cell. Among the common BCC metals are iron, carbon steels, chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten. The FCC unit cell can be envisioned as a cube with atoms at each of the eight corners and with one atom at the center of each of the six faces. Among the common FCC metals are aluminum, copper, nickel, and austenitic stainless steels. The BCT unit cell can be described by taking the basic BCC unit cell and elongating one axis to make it rectangular shaped with an atom in the center. Martensite, a phase of steel formed by rapid quenching, is a BCT structure. The HCP unit cell is a hexagonal prism. It can be envisioned as two hexagons, six-sided shapes, forming the top and bottom of the prism. An atom is located at the center and at each point of the hexagon. Three atoms, one at each point of a triangle, are located between the top and bottom hexagons. Among the common HCP metals are zinc, cadmium, and magnesium. A metal solidifies into a crystalline structure by a process known as nucleation and growth. Upon cooling, clusters of atoms nucleate or solidify at impurities or locations on a liquid solid boundary, such as that interface between the molten weld metal and the cooler unmelted heat affected zone. These clusters are called nuclei and they occur in great numbers. In the weld metal, the nuclei tend to attach themselves to existing grains of the heat affected zone at the weld interface. Atoms continue to solidify and attach themselves to the nuclei. Each nucleus grows along a preferred direction, with the atoms aligning themselves in the arrangement described by the appropriate unit cell to form an irregularly shaped grain or crystal. The display on your screen shows how the weld metal grains form as the weld metal solidifies. In display A, the initial crystals begin to form at the weld interface. Display B shows the solid grains formed as these initial nuclei grow. Since the nuclei are oriented differently, grain boundaries are formed when adjacent grains grow together. Display C shows the completed solidification of the weld metal. Grain boundaries are considered to be discontinuities because they represent interruptions in the uniform arrangement of the atoms. From our previous discussion, residual stress is present in the solidified metal. Mechanical properties can be dependent upon the grain size of the metal. A metal exhibiting a small grain size will have improved room temperature tensile strength because the grain boundaries tend to inhibit the deformation of individual grains when the material is stressed. However, at elevated temperatures, the atoms in the boundaries can move easily and slide past one another thus reducing the material strength at these higher temperatures. As a result, fine-grained materials are preferred for room and low temperature service, while coarse-grained materials are desirable for high temperature service. Fine-grained metals generally exhibit better ductility, notch toughness, and fatigue properties.
As a quick review before continuing, metals are crystalline structures formed by atoms in ordered patterns. This ordered pattern or arrangement is known as a phase and is described by a unit cell. Metals solidify from many locations at once and grow in preferred directions to form grains or crystals. The junction between individual grains is referred to as a grain boundary. The grain size will dictate the amount of grain boundary area present in a metal, which, in turn, determines to a certain degree the mechanical properties of the metal. The properties of metallic elements can be altered by the addition of other elements, which may or may not be metallic. Such a technique is known as alloying. The metal which results from this combination is referred to as an alloy. For example, the metallic element zinc is added to the metal copper to form the alloy brass. The nonmetal carbon is one of the alloying elements added to iron to form the alloy steel.